So our text verse that we'll read is uh, 2 Timothy 3, and uh, I'll read for us verses 12 through 17. So let's give attention now to God's holy and inspired word. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work." This is God's Word, and turn me now to uh, 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1, and I'll read uh, from verses 16 uh, through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with Him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is God's holy word. May bless our hearts this afternoon, and please turn me in your Belgic Confession of Faith now to Article 3, Belgic Confession of Faith, Article 3. If you have the Forms and Prayers book, that's page 154, page 154 in the Forms in prayers book. It's also page 855 in the songbook. Well, let's uh, listen now as I read uh, Article 3 of our Belgic Confession of Faith. The written Word of God. We confess that this Word of God was not sent nor delivered by the will of men, but that holy men of God spoke, being moved by the Holy Spirit, as Peter says. Afterwards, our God, because of the special care He has for us and our salvation, commanded His servants, the prophets and apostles, to commit this revealed Word to writing. He Himself wrote with His own finger the two tables of the law. Therefore, we call such writings holy and divine scriptures. Well, for the past uh, two Sundays, we've been considering God's own self-revelation. We began in Article 1 of the Belgian Confession of God's, with God's attributes, and then the next question that was logically after that was, how do you know all this? And we uh, talked about that God has revealed Himself to us in the book of general revelation and special revelation. General revelation in nature, in this world, and in uh, the fact that we're we're created in the image of God and we have a conscience, um, but also even more so and more clearly and fully in His holy and divine Word, in special revelation, which as we have it today is in the Bible. And for the next several weeks, we're going to focus on special revelation and in particular the Bible and its attributes. Uh, the attributes of Holy Scripture. And uh, we'll consider its inspiration today and then in the future its authority and its sufficiency and its clarity. But today let's uh, consider uh, the first of these attributes, the inspiration of the Bible, that the Bible is inspired. It's the inspired Word of God. And we'll ask three questions of this topic. First, what is inspiration? And then secondly, how is the Bible inspired, or how was Scripture inspired? 
And then third, how much of Scripture is inspired? So what is inspiration? How is Scripture inspired? How much of Scripture is inspired? First, what is inspiration? Well, the great uh, Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield has a, uh, a great work on this topic, the inspiration of the Scriptures, and he has a great definition of it, simple. He writes that inspiration is a supernatural influence exerted on the sacred writers by the Spirit of God, by virtue of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. I'll say that again. Inspiration is a supernatural influence exerted on the sacred writers by the Spirit of God, by virtue of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. In other words, inspiration refers to the fact that the Bible uh, is not, only, not only has a human author, but also has a divine author. God Himself wrote the Bible. This is God's Word. But what do we mean by that? Well, in order to better understand inspiration, let's consider just a few passages of Scripture. Uh, first, consider with me Deuteronomy chapter 18. If you have your Bibles, you may want to turn there to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18. And notice, uh, this is um, an important biblical text as God speaks of Moses as His prophet and this office of prophet that will come forth. From this point on in Israel's history. And notice how it's described in Deuteronomy 18 and verses 15 to 20. It says there that Yahweh the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see his this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Uh, here we see that the prophets didn't merely hear God's word and then write it down as if it was all dictated to them. Rather, God says, I will put my words in their mouth. And uh, what a remarkable statement that is. Imagine God telling you, you're going to be a prophet, and I'm going to put my words in your mouth. But here we begin to see that the words of the prophets and apostles are the very words of God Himself. Now, on some occasions, the Lord did actually speak to the prophets audibly, and they were to write down exactly what they heard, not adding to or subtracting from any of it. Uh, think of the book of Revelation, for example, where John is often told to write what he sees and hears. But most of the time, the prophets and apostles spoke in the name of God and of Christ. And God guided and preserved the pen of the writers by the Holy Spirit in an amazing, miraculous way. Uh, but notice then 2 Timothy 3.15. You can go back to there, which we read a moment ago. Another passage, important passage, and we'll come back to this passage lots in the next few weeks. But 2 Timothy 3, notice what it says there once again. In verse 16, it says, all Scripture is, and here's a key phrase here, breathed out by God. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. That the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Notice how Paul says that it's all breathed out by God. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Paul uses an interesting uh, compound word here that isn't used anywhere else in the New Testament. Uh, Theopneustos, which theos is the Greek word for God, and neustos is the, from the Greek word for spirit. So God and a spirit, but it can also be translated as breath or wind. 
So when you put them together, the best translation is what we have in our ESV translation. God breathed or breathed out by God. In other words, all Scripture originates in Him and comes out of Him so that it's His Word. It's just like in order for me to just talk right now, I have to breathe. I have to breathe. If I just talk and I don't breathe, then eventually I run out of breath and I, you know, and I just start getting all squeaky and, <laughs> and then I just stop, right? But you have to have breath to talk. And that's the idea here, that, that it's all breathed out by God. It's His Word. Um, and so in some older translations, like the old King James, it doesn't really capture the full meaning uh, because in the King James it says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. A better way to put it is just it's God-breathed. Uh, because to say that it's given by inspiration of God, it could mean several things. You know, artists are often asked, uh, who or what is your inspiration? You know, you wrote this song, you did this amazing uh, work of art. Uh, what, what's your inspiration? And they often list other artists that were their inspiration. Um, and so, let's, oh, they were inspired by uh, Beethoven or something like that, right? But their work is their work. It's not Beethoven's work, Right? And so that's why inspiration isn't totally, the word inspiration in English doesn't totally translate uh, today into what, we, what the biblical uh, concept of inspiration is. The biblical concept of inspiration is that it is breathed out by God. And this is fundamental to understanding the authority and sufficiency of the Bible. Uh, the reason that the Bible has such authority the authority, it's the authoritative Word of God and it's sufficient for all that we need for the Christian life uh, to know what to believe concerning God and how we're to live for His glory is because it is the Word of God. And therefore, it is authoritative, true, trustworthy, holy, perfect, and sufficient. Uh, Joel Beakey in his uh, work on systematic theology writes that inspiration is the work of the Holy Spirit to produce the Bible through human authors so that it is God's Word just as surely as the breath of our mouths produces our own words. And so that's what we mean by that. Now, it's also important to just add a, another thing that uh, another theologian mentions in his work, Robert Lethem, that Scripture is not to be seen in a deistic sense. Right? Often we talk about deism as being this worldview that God created the world. He's like a divine clock maker. It's like he created a clock and wound it up, set it on a mantle, walked away, left it to itself. And Lethem says we shouldn't think of Scripture in a deistic sense, as if the, the Spirit inspired the Scriptures and then just kind of walked away and just left it to itself. Uh, Ermann Bovink put it this way, it was not only God-breathed at the time it was written, it is God-breathing. In other words, it was divinely inspired, not merely while it was written, God breathing through the writers, but also while it is being read. It continues to be the inspired Word of God. God breathing through the Scripture. So that divine inspiration is a permanent attribute of the Scripture. God continues to speak and in and through his word today. In other words, this is not a dead letter. This continues to be living and active. It's a, the living and active word of God. Uh, one final passage I'll draw your attention back to, which we read a moment ago, is uh, 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1. And notice this remarkable thing that Peter says in 2 Peter 1. He says, we ourselves, in verse 18, heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Isn't that a remarkable statement right there? Uh, Peter's recalling the time when Peter, James, and John were brought up on the Mount of Transfiguration and got that privileged opportunity to see the Lord Jesus Christ in His glory as it was unveiled to them. 
And uh, the voice came from heaven, right? This is my beloved son. Listen to him, which, by the way, connects to Deuteronomy 18. Listen to that prophet that's coming. It's ultimately Jesus. But it's remarkable. He says, look, I heard that voice from heaven, but we have something more sure. Right here, we have the prophetic word of God. And that's just remarkable to me because often we might think, well, I'd rather have been there and heard that. But no, we, we actually have something more sure in the word of God, the prophetic word. And notice what he says in verse 20, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is a the metaphor he uses here is that of like a sailboat and the wind carrying a sailboat to its intended goal, its intended destination. The Holy Spirit carried them along to His intended goal. And He spoke through them. Uh, so that's what inspiration is. It's a supernatural influence exerted on the sacred writers by the Spirit of God by virtue of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. You see, you can trust this word because it's inspired and because it's inspired it's inerrant it does not err and it's infallible it cannot err god does not and cannot lie and therefore his word does not and cannot lie it's entirely trustworthy inerrant and infallible but that's what inspiration is but Let's try to understand this concept a little bit more in our second point. How then was the Bible inspired? How was Scripture inspired? Now there's three basic views as to the mode of inspiration. Uh, the first is the dynamic view. So there's, I'll just tell you them up front. The dynamic view, the my mechanical view, and the organic view the dynamic, mechanical, and organic view. The dynamic view says that the Holy Spirit affected only the writers, but not the writings themselves. In other words, the Holy Spirit inspired them, like we heard earlier, like a, you know, an artist might be inspired by another artist. Like a poet is inspired by Shakespeare to write poetry. Uh, in this view, the authors of Scripture were merely recording their religious feelings for us and so we don't really have god's word in the bible in this view and this is the view of liberalism uh, which we've already seen from second timothy 3 and second peter 1 is not what the bible teaches it's not supported in the scriptures themselves and perhaps you've encountered this you've met people who you know maybe you know, they love to read the Bible and they, they find some good moral principles in here, but at the end of the day, they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. And so when you bring uh, certain parts of the Bible to bear upon their life, maybe certain moral principles or speak about the miracles of the Bible, they won't accept it because they don't believe in those things and they don't really believe that this is the authoritative Word of God. This is actually merely the Word of man. I had an experience like that, uh, sadly, with one of my relatives once. Uh, we got in a conversation about the topic of homosexuality, and I was maintaining the biblical view that it's a sin to practice homosexuality, and his question to me was, well, who wrote that? I said, Paul, the apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he said, exactly, Paul wrote it, and Paul erred. I said, no, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. This is the Word of God. Uh, yes, Paul wrote it, but the Holy Spirit wrote it through the Apostle Paul. This is God's Word. And so in this view, the, the human author is privileged over the divine. The mechanical view is the extreme opposite of the dynamic view. It's the view of fundamentalism and is a reaction to liberalism. Uh, in the mechanical view, the belief is that God dictated to them everything. He dictated everything to them uh, or that he used them like an inanimate object, right? They were like a um, divine pen, if you will, that God just sort of picked up and they were sort of maybe in a trance state of some kind, put to sleep or whatever, 
Um, and like an inanimate object, like a divine pen, he used them to write things, almost like a divine pen or a divine puppet, you might say. And uh, it's worth noting that this is the view of inspiration that Muslims hold to. They believe that the Quran is the Word of God because Allah was actually moving the pen of Muhammad. And this has come up a couple times in the D4 club that I go to each week. And there's Muslims in there, and this has been a topic. You know, how do you know you can trust the Bible when they talk about inspiration? And, and this is their view. But rather, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit used men to write Scripture and did it in such a way that He did not suppress the personalities of the men who wrote it. They weren't just like inanimate objects. And uh, this is what we call the organic view. In the organic view, we believe that the Bible is fully human and fully divine. That is to say that the Bible is a God-breathed book and as such originates in God and is written by Him, but at the same time, God used the men whom He chose to write the Bible in such a way that He preserved their personality and style of writing so that we can say that Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah, Paul wrote the book of Galatians, and so forth. We can attribute full authorship to the human who wrote it and full authorship to God of every book of the Bible. But what is our basis for holding this view? Well, it's the Bible itself. The Bible is our basis for holding this view. In the words of uh, Michael Horton, the Scripture itself teaches an organic rather than a mechanical view of revelation. That is to say, God revealed Himself in the natural circumstances, environment, culture, language, and gifts of the human writers. The revelation did not come all at once, but as Hebrews 1 puts it, in many times and in many ways. Sometimes it was a direct word, something close to dictation, thus saith the Lord, or write thus. More frequently, though, it was an edited summary of what God had said and done, drawn from previous oral or written sources. And so God preserved their personalities. Uh, and the Bible clearly reflects various times, places, personalities, and styles of writing. Uh, look at 2 Peter 3, verse 15. What Peter says here, he says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. These are some, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Notice a couple of things that first, Peter acknowledges that what Paul writes is scripture. It's placed on par on the same level, verse 16, with the other scriptures. They twist other scriptures to their own destruction and they twist the scriptures that Paul wrote to their own dis destruction. But both are divine scriptures and Paul's writings are different than Peter's writings, Peter says here. Look, Paul writes some things, Peter says, that are kind of hard to understand at times. <laughs> I might not have put it that way if I wrote it. And so that's just evidence right there in the Bible itself that God preserves the personalities, the gifts of the human authors uh, so that, uh, that there's an organic view of inspiration and this is one of the beautiful things about the Bible, isn't it? That um, it's so interesting, it's so fascinating, it's so beautiful that um, you have this one message, this one author, the Holy Spirit, who inspires this one message of redemption in Jesus Christ, who saves us from all of our sins and misery and is bringing us into the new creation. That's the, the message from the beginning to end. And yet it's told from, from over many, many centuries through all kinds of authors and there's all kinds of genres, there's poetry, there's, there's historical narrative, there's prophetic literature, there's gospel, there's acts, there's revelation, there's letters. It's a beautiful uh, work of the Holy Spirit, ultimately. And this alone testifies that it is holy and divine. 
As Article 5 of the Belgian Confession will point out that the Holy Spirit not only witnesses to us in our hearts that this is God's Word, but the Scriptures carry the evidence within themselves that this is the Word of God. And so we don't hold to this uh, liberal dynamic view of inspiration because we believe it's fully God's Word. And we don't hold to the mechanical view either because we believe that God preserved the human authors as well. As uh, one person put it, God moved the writers of the Bible using their style, vocabulary, research, and personalities in such a way to communicate His perfect, unerring Word to His church. Or as First Peter put it again, uh, for no proph- 2 Peter 1, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men, sp- but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, no doubt there's some level of mystery to this. This is something we can't fully grasp with our finite minds. Uh, It's similar to how we can't fully comprehend the doctrine of the incarnation that God the Son added a real human nature and now we refer to Him as the God-man. He's one person with two natures. He's true God and He's true man. And uh, this doctrine of inspiration is similar to that. Uh, As Michael Horton beautifully put it, he says, far from suppressing human involvement, God wrapped His gospel in the swaddling cloths of human speech. Though the inspiration of Scripture is qualitatively different from the incarnation of the living Word, the incarnation proves that God enters into our world fully without losing any of His transcendence or truthfulness. If the eternal Son could become fully human without sin, then surely God can communicate His truth through thoroughly human ambassadors while preserving their writings from error. And so this is how Scripture is inspired. It is the inspired Word of God. We ask our children in the children's catechism, who wrote the Bible? And the answer is, holy men inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, But this is the mode of inspiration. It's an organic mode. But then, third and finally, how much of Scripture is inspired? And the short answer is, all of it. All of it is inspired. And here there's only really two views. Either part of it's inspired or all of it's inspired. Uh, Some hold to a partial view and try to maintain that the the moral and religious teachings of the Bible are inspired, but not so much the history, archaeology, chronology of events, and miracles. Uh, So they would say it's sort of like the kernel and husk of grain. The kernel is the, the good stuff that you want to eat, but the husk you can just discard, or sort of like sunflower seeds, you know. Uh, There's the inside that you eat, and then the shell you just sort of spit out. And so they think the Bible is kind of like that. There's, this isn't the Word of God, but it contains the Word of God. There's, There's parts in here that are the Word of God, but not all of it is the Word of God. And, uh, of course, we reject that view. Uh, The other view is that all of the Bible is inspired. And this is known as verbal plenary inspiration. Now, those are some big words. What do we mean by verbal plenary inspiration? Well, verbal, it refers to the fact that the Bible is inspired in every word. Every word of the Bible is inspired. There's not one word that is not inspired. And plenary means the whole of it is inspired. All of it is inspired. And we see this idea of verbal inspiration, that all the words of the Bible are inspired, uh, in, a, in a couple places. First, Jesus himself, remember, said in Matthew 5, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, how many of you know what an iota or dot is? You probably know what a dot is. It's a dot. <laughs> uh, well, an iota refers to the smallest uh, Hebrew letter, which is a yod, and a dot is the serif part of a letter. In other words, it's Jesus's, if we think in like the English language, like the dot on an I, 
and the crossing of a T, right? We use that language today, you know, we've got to dot all our I's and cross all of our T's. So Jesus is saying that even the smallest parts of the Hebrew Scriptures are God's Word and shall not pass away. And uh, Jesus and Paul also demonstrate the authority of every word of the Bible. In Matthew 22, when the Pharisees are arguing over who Jesus is, Jesus argues that He is David's son and that He is the Christ based on one word in Psalm 110. Where David, if you remember, says that Yahweh, the Lord, says to Adonai, my Lord, my Lord, sit at my right hand. That's one word in the Hebrew, Adonai, and that one word is inspired by God. And Jesus bases his argument that he is the Christ on that one word. Also, Paul reminded the Galatians that the promise of God to Abraham was not that in your offsprings, plural, shall all the nations be blessed, but in your offspring, singular. And uh, again, Paul bases this argument on one word in the Hebrew. And even more, the singular form of the word is inspired. Paul says it pointed forward to Christ. In Abraham's one offspring shall all the nations be blessed, and that offspring is Christ. Also, if you don't believe that every word of the Bible, so not only is it, it, we see in the Scriptures that it teaches that every word is inspired, but if you don't believe that every word of the Bible is inspired, well, then it loses its objective authority. And you're lost in a sea of relativism, aren't you? You're just picking and choosing what parts of the Bible you think are inspired and which ones you think aren't. And that will inevitably result in idolatry. And not a divine revelation, but a human revelation rooted in your own idolatrous imagination. And so for these various reasons, we believe that every word of the Bible is inspired. Again, as Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture, not some Scripture, but all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, what are some of the practical implications of all this for us today? How should we respond to the doctrine of inspiration of Scriptures? Well, first, you should marvel at the sovereignty and love of God in guiding and preserving His Word for the sake of your salvation. I love how our confession points this out when it writes that afterwards our God, because of the special care He has for us and our salvation, commanded His servants, the prophets and apostles, to commit this revealed word to writing. It's even stronger in the Latin text which says, certainly God Himself from His immense care and concern did this for us and for our salvation. See, God is so good, and He's the overflowing fountain of all good. And like a loving parent who earnestly wants to impress upon His children that He loves them and will always love them, He will always protect them and provide for them all that they need, so to our Heavenly Father wants us to know of our eternal salvation and our eternal security in Christ. And so He gives us His inspired Word to assure us of his eternal love in Christ, and to feed and nourish our souls into everlasting life. And so let us praise God that we have the inspired Word of God. Praise God for His sovereignty and love in guiding and preserving His Word for the sake of our salvation. And then also it should comfort you to know that the Bible is the inspired Word of God because you can trust this book. You can trust it. This is the very Word of God. It reveals who God truly is and who you truly are. It shows you the way, the truth, and the life in Jesus Christ. Without God's Word, we would all be lost in this world. We would be children of wrath, destined for destruction, who only have God's general revelation, which leaves us without excuse. But God has revealed Himself to us in His Word as the God of grace for those who trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And you can trust this gospel Word because it's the inspired Word of God. You can sing with your children, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? 
For the Bible tells me so. You can trust that Jesus loves you. This I know. Why, children? For the Bible tells me so. If the Bible isn't the inspired and inerrant and infallible Word of God, then you can't trust it. You can't sing that song. But because it is God's inspired Word, you can trust it. And you can say with the Apostle Paul, as he says in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. You can sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And since Jesus did die for us, and since this is God's inspired, authoritative, and trustworthy Word, let us obey all that God commands of us in His Word out of thankfulness for so great a salvation in Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank You for uh, Your inspired Word, and that in such a marvelous way You have worked in and through the human authors in such a way that you've preserved their personalities and gifts and used them, and that you have spoken through them to us, your people, so that we might know you, so that we might know of our Savior Jesus Christ and how he saves us from all of our sins and misery, is that we might follow him as our good shepherd who is always leading us and guiding us in just the right paths for your namesake, and that we can know that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Help us to never take for granted your holy, inerrant, and inspired word, and to trust it, to believe it, to feed upon it, and to follow in your ways revealed in your word. And we look forward to the day we'll see Christ face to face and be like him. We pray, Lord Jesus, Quickly come, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.